Okay, it said I had poor connection, but I had good connection a while ago. So welcome to today's Friday Lunch and Learn with me. And today we're going to be talking about diabetes and a brand new, it may not be brand new, but it is fairly new concoction, all right, with traditional Chinese medicine. Now, I kind of have a little bit of problem with this because I don't speak Chinese. And so when I'm looking at the ingredients, it's a little bit hard for me to figure it out. However, there are over 20 PubMed articles on this uh, encapsulation. It's granules, and um, it can reduce your chances of getting diabetes by 41%, which is a ginormous move forward because diabetes is one of those diseases that is known as a comorbidity. That means if you have this disease, you're probably going to have others. And if you have this disease, you're probably going to have a more fatal reaction to any other kind of health issue that you have. So we want to make sure that we uh, have a handle on what causes diabetes and what may be out there that can help us. And so I want to give you some statistics, and then I want to go into this report. So this is from the Center for Disease Control, all right? The upward trend of diabetes may lead to as many as 22, sorry, 220,000 young people having type 2 diabetes in 2060, a nearly 70, no, I'm sorry, a nearly 700% increase in the number of people with type 1 diabetes and could increase as much as 65% in the next 40 years. Now, nobody proofread this. I'm just going to tell you as a former grammar teacher, this is pretty poor grammar. Um, however, let me break it down to you. Um, between now and 2060, they expect for type 2 diabetes to grow by 70%. They expect type 1 diabetes to only grow by 3%. So if there's anything that we can do to stop the progression of the disease state, then this is something that we need to do. So there are several conditions or explanations that give rise to type 2 diabetes, including the increasing prevalence of childhood obesity. The presence of diabetes in people of childbearing age might be another important factor because maternal diabetes risk increases the diabetes risk of the children. People with diabetes are at higher risk for heart disease, stroke, diabetes complication, and premature death more than those people who do not have diabetes. Researchers are actively investigating ways for preventing type 1 diabetes, and studies in adults have identified steps that can be taken to reduce the risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Now, in my studies somewhere along the way, can't name names because I don't remember, but in my studies along the way, I learned that type 1 diabetes is almost always parasitic. And so if you deal with the parasite that attacks the pancreas, then you're going to have some success there. Type 2 diabetes is an insulin resistance situation. And if you deal with that and obesity, being overweight and food choices all contribute to that. So we know that diabetes is a very prevalent disease. It is reaching epidemic proportion with millions of people developing the disease each year. Safe and effective treatments for preventing type 2 diabetes in persons with high risk for the disease are needed. This is according to Dr. Michael Katz, who is the president and chief executive officer of New York City Health and Hospitals. He wrote this on June the 3rd as an editor's note in the uh, JAMA Internal Medicine um, magazine. So the question is posed is, what if there already is an effective treatment, but it's having trouble getting FDA approval? And so this is something that I want to talk to you about, give you a little bit of behind the scenes information before we go on with this report. So. Here in the United States, you have access to herbs and supplements across the board. You can go to the grocery store and get them. You can go to the big box store and get them. You can go to the drugstore and get them. Or you can come to a specialized clinic and get them. The difference in going to a specialized clinic, me, okay, someone like me, is that you are going to be getting wild crafted, wild harvested, made by hand 
supplements, in most cases, not 100%, but in most cases, they are going to be more expensive because they are handmade, all right? When you go to the big box stores and the grocery stores and that, you're getting really cheap supplements that are made by machines. And also, you're getting standardized ingredients. So what does that mean? Well, um, it's going to be a little bit of an explanation, but I think you're going to be able to track with me. Out in the wild, the way God grows things, right? You've got various things going on. You've got different water, depending on what's in the air with the rain. You've got different soils, depending on where things are planted, what's planted next to them, how the soil is treated, how the plants are fertilized, if they are, if they're not, all those kind of things. And so all of those kind of things have a factor on what the constituents of the plant are. Now, in most cases, with the big box stores and the grocery stores and that kind of thing, they will take the plant, they will process the plant, and they will pull the uh, ingredient that they want to pull. They will pull that out. We can say magnesium. We can say uh, calcium. We can say we can say whatever ingredient. It doesn't matter. But they'll pull that ingredient out, and they will package it at a standard milligram per dose, and that is standardized. Now, the problem with standardized is, well, let's talk about the good part. The good part of standardized is you know that you're getting exactly the same dose, exactly the same way with that particular brand. So you've got consistency there, which is, of course, what we have with our pharmaceuticals. The bad thing about standardization is that um, when they're taking that constituent, the magnesium or the calcium or whatever it is, out of wherever they're getting it, and I know I'm giving you two minerals which don't grow in a plant, so don't don't write to me. I'm trying to do this and um, I don't have my I don't have notes on this, so just bear with me. When they're taking that part out, they're taking all the cofactors out. Let's talk about the plant aspergina. Aspergina is an analgesic. It's a pain reliever. This is where we get our pharmaceutical aspirin from. They take the analgesic property out of the aspergina plant and they make aspirin and it does work but what are the side effects of aspirin you can have macular degeneration you can have ulcers all kinds of things if you took the aspergina plant and you made a tincture out of it it's got all the buffering agents and the cofactors and all that kind of stuff that is not going to hurt your eyes and not going to hurt your tummy so a whole wild grown wild crafted um, constituent, whatever that is, a whole plant, right, you're going to get all of those benefits and it's not standardized. So we here in the clinic, we do a lot of whole wild crafted, uh, wild harvested by hand that has all of the cofactors and it's not standardized. So as we're moving into this report, when it's talking about there's this uh, component that the Chinese have put together, 17 different herbs, they put it together and they have found that this particular blend has a 41% chance or reduce your risk of diabetes by 41%, which is a huge thing. Now, it's having hurdles getting approval, even though there's more than 20 PubMed articles. So you've got your PubMed, you've got your natural uh, Institute of Health, you've got, there's all other kinds of things, but we're talking about government funded research, right? You've got all of these uh, reports that say that this combination of herbs works, and yet you and I are not able to get it because it's having hurdles with the FDA. One of the things that I learned in this study is that for you to get a drug approved in the United States, you've got to fork over four million dollars. So um, that's a pretty hefty price, which is why we've got some issues with our medications. So this study, this one study, was published in JAMA in the Internal Medicine, and it shows that Genlida, I may not say that right, but it's J-I-N-L-I-D-A, is a treatment approved for type 2 diabetes in China. It is composed of 17 herbal ingredients, and it reduces the risk of developing diabetes in individuals with impaired glucose tolerance 
This condition involves elevated blood sugar levels that have not yet reached the threshold for being diagnosed a diabetic. Participants taking Genlita experience a 41% lower risk in developing diabetes compared with those receiving a placebo. This study involved 885 participants aged 17 to 70 monitored over two years. All of the participants engaged in healthy lifestyle intervention programs, and do we not need that here in America? In America, that we have uh, two in three people are overweight, and one in three people is obese. So we do have very much metabolic disorder here in the United States, and a lot of it is because of the food additives that we allow a part of it is because of our uh, food processing, which makes the foods very, very addictive with very little nutritive value. So all of the participants engage in lifestyle modification, which would be diet and exercise and that kind of thing, right? They received a booklet of recommendations for daily habits, such as regular physical activity, including protein and carbohydrate intake, increased dietary fiber, and reducing sodium consumption. Now, we deal with a lot of diabetics here in the clinic. And when I would ask them, when you go to your doctor and you were diagnosed, because I can't diagnose, right? I'm not medical. When you go to your doctor and you were diagnosed, what did they tell you about reducing your carbohydrate consumption? And they say, well, I don't know anything about that. They didn't say anything about that. And so I'm just going to tell you, if you reduce your carbohydrate intake, to no more than 30 grams per meal, no more than 90 grams per day, you're going to go a very long way in reducing your need for intervention with sugar issues. So your doctor's not going to tell you that. I don't know why they're not going to tell you that, but they don't. If you will exercise, when you eat a lot of carbohydrates, you will um, uh, metabolize that sugar a lot faster and you're going to be able to do better if you are a diabetic. And also, if you start your day with protein at the first of the day, not pancakes, not a bagel, not toast, but protein, hamburger patty, egg, chicken breast, something like that, then you're going to keep your blood sugar stable all throughout the day. So there are a lot of things that you can do with lifestyle intervention to reduce and remove the need for medications. So that's something your doctor's not going to tell you that we are going to tell you. And the people that were on these studies, they got that information. So one group took nine grams of Genlita capsules three times daily, while the other group just took a placebo. This approach enabled the researchers to assess the effectiveness of the Genlita granules alongside lifestyle interventions in preventing diabetes and managing related health concerns. Now, everybody had the lifestyle intervention, all right? Everybody had the same guidelines for protein and carbohydrates and uh, exercise and all that kind of thing. So this is a quote from the study. To our knowledge, this study is the first to investigate the synergistic effects of traditional Chinese medicine and lifestyle modifications among participants with, with uh, insulin glucose intolerances, right? abdominal obesity, and metabolic disorders. The researchers noted that they highlighted the combination of traditional Chinese medicine with conventional preventative strategies. The results showed that the individuals who, had the, who were in the Genlita group had lower incidence of diabetes and demonstrated improvements in waist size, body mass index, and cholesterol levels. Significant decreases were noticed in both after meal and fasting blood glucose sugar levels and the A1C and measure long-term blood glucose levels. Jalinda Genlita, I'm sorry, was also linked to better cholesterol profiles with reduction in bad cholesterol, triglycerides, and an increase in the good cholesterol. Now, let me explain this. You're not going to have cholesterol issues unless you have an inflammatory process going on in your body. Diabetes is an inflammatory process. So you quit eating the carbohydrates, you quit eating the processed food, you exercise, all of that is going to lower your inflammatory index. And when we do that, then your body doesn't have to make cholesterol. But cholesterol is nature's way of squashing the inflammation. 
So there's a lot more to this report than anybody's going to tell you because that's just not how our medical system works here in the United States. But we know that if we can get you off the processed food, get you off the inflammatory foods, that your body is going to just respond a whole lot better, whether it's your cholesterol numbers, your insulin resistance, um, your liver uh, enzymes, all that kind of stuff. You're going to just do better if you have the right kind of nutrition in front of you and if you remove the inflammation. So this is not the first study to suggest genlitis effectiveness in blood sugar management. A 2021 study in the Journal of Diabetes Research concluded that genlitis granules can improve glycemic control and glycemic variability in patients with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. In China, genlita granules are routinely used either alone or with other medications such as metformin. Taken with warm water, the granules are part of a broader approach to traditional Chinese medicine and has gained popularity due to its perceived effectiveness. According to May Research, a scientific report the exact mechanisms by which Genlita works remains unclear. Now, I was able to go to these PubMed articles and I was able to look at the list of ingredients. Honestly, some of them I've never ever heard of before. And so uh, it might be something that we call it by a different name here in the United States. But this particular 17 um, ingredient concoction that they make, okay, it's in granules, but you, you put it into liquid. Apparently, they've done it in such a way that it acts on the problems that we have when we are uh, insulin resistance and we're not able to manage our sugar. These natural herbs go in and help the body sort out what it's missing, and it does a lot of great things to reduce the risk of diabetes, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing especially since we just read the report from the CDC that says that the incidence of diabetes is supposed to grow 700% between now and 2060. That's a lot. In the United States, herbal treatments and medications face different regulatory standards. And this is what I was talking about with you earlier. Medications must undergo rigorous testing for safety and effectiveness and receive approval from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Herbal treatments are usually marketed as dietary supplements, and the FDA considers herbal supplements as foods, not medicine, according to John Hopkins Medicine. All right, this is a quote. New herbal supplements and products are not governed by the strict FDA drug approval process, and there is no pre-market approval required. Christopher T. Ty Williams, associate professor of nursing at Vanderbilt University, wrote in a 2021 review. According to the editor's note in JAMA, the companies only need to notify the FDA of their belief in the supplement safety before it's able to hit the market. Now, this is true and not true. When the herbs come in, they undergo different kinds of testing to make sure that they're not harmful. So there are tests that they do undergo. However, the, the part about the FDA thinking that supplements are food is true. We think that supplements are food. And the reason we think they're food is because they grow in the ground. <laughs> we get them wild crafted, wild harvested. They grow wherever God decides for them to grow. So you've got to go and find them. It's not like you've got a plot of land behind your house and you want to plant all these things in there. That's not wild harvested, right? That is you plant it and whatever comes up is what comes up. So holistic people believe that God is really smart. All right, hopefully you believe that. Uh, but we also believe that because God is really smart, where the plants decide to grow is the absolute best soil environment, best air environment, all, all the things. It is the best environment for that plant to produce the medicinal qualities that that plant needs to produce for us, for our well-being. Now, I personally believe that we are supposed to have medicines from the ground. I personally believe, just like the Bible says, that, um, you know, the, the leaves of the tree are for their healing. I believe that every green herb that you eat is for your health. I do believe that. 
And so when we get these wild crafted, wild harvested, it has all, it has exactly what we need from where we are in life, where we are in the universe, where we are with environmental toxicity and all that kind of stuff. So we want to get it as natural as possible. And that's why the, it can't be patented because it's not the same. It's not standardized as I talked about earlier, which is why it's so hard to get these things quote unquote improved as a medicine. So hopefully I'm not belaboring the point very much. Um, but the FDA is very, very quick to say that supplements do not cure. And we holistic people can never say this supplement will cure you because if we say that, and if it does, then they can come after us for practicing medicine without a license here in the state of Texas. That's the way the law is. So the FDA says that supplements are foods. We say that supplements are foods. Sometimes we call them food grade supplements. So products that have claims to treat, diagnose, prevent, or cure diseases are generally subject to regulation as drugs. The FDA website states that if a supplement promises a cure or quick fix to a health problem, it is probably too good to be, to be true. So this regulatory gap means that even when herbal products such as Genlita granules show promising results and strong safety profiles in clinical trials, they still face significant hurdles to be recognized on par with pharmaceutical drugs. Now, part of the problem that we have here in the United States is me. I am not medical. I am holistic. We tell everybody we're not medical. We are holistic. We do natural herbs and supplements, and there's, there's really no harm, no foul in that. Nobody has a problem with that. If I had medical doctor at the end of my name and I gave you an herb and a supplement, I could get in trouble because it is not FDA approved and the FDA uh, gar uh, governs everything that happens in the medical world. So you've got this problem of there are these products that has been proven, 20 PubMed studies prove that this 17 ingredient concoction works to prevent the progression of diabetes, but it's not lawful for medical practitioners to give this to their patients here in the United States because it is not FDA approved. So there's something wrong with this picture. If there is a food, which is what herbs are, they are foods, and if you are a medical doctor and you want to prescribe foods for your patient, then you should be able to do this. And so there's, you know, you've got to figure out which side of the street you're on. There is this concoction called Genlida. I don't know where you can get it here in the United States. It's not been approved to be used here in the United States. And yet we've got more than 20 uh, PubMed studies that say that it is. So the journey for approval for the FDA, as I said, involves significant barriers. Were this a pill, there would be questions about what stage it was in with the Food and Drug Administration approval process, Dr. Katz wrote in his editorial note. For herbal formulations to win FDA approval, the manufacturers must demonstrate consistent composition and dosage in addition to proving effectiveness and safety. And this is particularly challenging for botanical products such as Genlita, which Dr. Cass states can vary depending on the growing conditions and the uh, process complex chemical profile. So that's what I was telling you earlier. You can take the analgesic property out of the aspergina plant and you can have aspirin as a standardized ingredient. More healthy for you is to use the whole plant, which is not going to have uniform constituents because of where it is grown, the climate it's grown, the soil it's grown, the air, the rain. All of those things are going to make each particular crop different. All right. And this is a good thing for us. So think about uh, echinacea. Think about goldenrod. Think about 
uh, wild oregano oil. Think about those things that we normally think of as natural antibiotics, right? So if you are a patient and you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you antibiotics for XYZ, whatever you have, that may work. It may not work. It is, I guarantee you, it's going to tear up your gut because that's just what it does. So then you're going to have to go and replant the good probiotics and you're going to have to, you know, have clean up an aisle two and that kind of thing. What happens, as so many people do, instead of taking their antibiotics for two weeks like the doctor tells them to, they take it for five days, they feel better, they save the rest of it for next time. And what happens is that pathogen, whatever it is, it hasn't really been killed. It's just been knocked down. The pathogen says, oh, this antibiotic looks like this. Let me morph into something that is antibiotic resistant so that I can live. Right. Because I want to do what I want to do. But that's what pathogens do. They have a brain. They want to survive. And so they adapt to become antibiotic resistant. Right. With holistic things, your pathogen has not seen that exact thing before. Even if you've done echinacea today, you've done echinacea last year, you've done echinacea 10 years ago. I guarantee you, if you have a wild crafted, uh, wild harvested product, the constituents are going to be different. And this particular pathogen has never seen that before. And so it's not able to mount a resistance to it because it's something that is absolutely brand new. So this is why this Genlita works as well as it does, because it's not consistent. It is. It grows wherever it grows. It has all those constituents. They put it together the way they put it together. And I'm sure that is a uniform way that they do that. But the absolute constituents are different, which will not allow it to be approved by the FDA the way we do business here. So the report goes on to say that even if herbal companies prove safety and efficacy, the cost would be prohibitive for many of the smaller companies. A 2024 application fee alone, application fee requesting a new drug approval from the FDA is more than $4 million, which is a sharp increase from last year, which was $3.2 million. So despite the recent trial's positive outcome and lowering the risk of developing diabetes, licensed medical professionals such as doctors will not be able to prescribe this formula until it is FDA approved. All right. It says customers may still obtain similar formulas from traditional Chinese medicine practitioners or herbalists. And this is true. That is true. There are herbs that we know will help with sugar metabolism and that kind of thing. And we do have um, many, many people that we have looked at over the years with diabetes and they no longer have diabetes. Now, have we healed them of diabetes? No, we have not healed them. We have given their body healing that their body needs so their own bodies can mount that defense against that disease pathogen. So there's a whole different methodology between holistic people like me and what we do. We don't cure disease. We give the body whatever the body is missing so the body is able to mount a defense and the body is able to heal itself. There's no drug that's going to heal you. There's no herb that's going to heal you. Herbs are foods. When we are malnourished, we are prone to sickness and disease. When we are malnourished, our body does not have the raw materials to do what it needs to do so that we can be healthy. So we partner with the design of the body. God said, eat good food, sleep good sleep, work good work, right? That's, got, and that's the way it was back in Genesis. And that's the way we need to do today. We do know that the food, industrial food uh, complex here in the United States, the food has lost much of its nutritional uh, density. And so that's why we need to supplement with vitamins, minerals, and all these beautiful supplements that we have. So there are ways to stop, reverse, prevent diabetes, right? It's lifestyle it's changing what you eat. It's fortifying your body with the herbs that you need so that your body can do what it needs to do so that you're not processed, uh, prone to a disease process. So that's a lot. 
That's a lot of information that I gave you. If you want to do your own research, please do. Like I said, I just did a cursory study and I read some of those reports and they do exactly what they say they're going to do. Uh, there's a whole list of those herbs and uh, like I say, some of them I didn't recognize, but I don't know everything. And um, if it reduces your risk of diabetes by 41%, why would you not? Why would you not do this? We need to change the way we do medicine here in the United States so that we can prevent, reverse, do the things that we need to do so that we can live long and strong. So it is the weekend. Thank you so much for being with me. Uh, like, share, comment, ask questions, and um, I'll give you my best shot on the answers. And um, I will see you next week. Take care.